Hello and welcome back to Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch for the Somerville Media Center. Today is May 7th, 2020. I am joined with State Representative Denise Provo and State Representative Mike Conley. Good afternoon. How are you both today? Good afternoon. Fine, thanks. I'm doing well, Joe. Thank you again for having us. Terrific. We have a full show today. State Rep. Provo is going to be talking about the nursing home situation or the after care, uh, senior care nursing situation, the governor's reopening advisory board, and uh, what we, is sure to be a brutal state budget coming forward. Rep. Conley, you've got some things on, on the docket here, including um, the transparency efforts at the state house, uh, at the state house representatives, uh, talking about new ways of doing business moving forward. And then finally, we're going to be talking about the decarceration in the prison and jail system. I'm going to start off with State Rep. Provo. Um, Denise, the news from Medford in the past two to three days has been devastating. 54 residents of the Courtyard Nursing Facility have died as a result of COVID. I'm going to lead off with that sad news, but I'm sure you may have some good stuff to report as well. Take it away, Denise. Well, thank you. Um, and I, I do have to say that, that some nursing homes have done a much better job than others of um, managing infection in their facilities and keeping residents and staff safe. Um, but it's not, it's not always, it's not always in the case. Uh, fortunately, some individuals who have loved ones in nursing homes have directly contacted legislators for help, which has given us um, a view of what's gone on inside some of these facilities, which in turn has allowed us to advocate much more effectively for more stringent rules. And a week ago, Monday, the Baker administration, for the first time, required that all staff in nursing home be tested. And it, I know it may sound surprising that this wasn't the rule already, uh, but it wasn't. And you know, some staffers work in multiple facilities. It was, it was really. Um, I think a poorly thought out regulatory setup that relied too much on voluntary compliance. And some defenseless people have paid a high price. Denise, let me ask you a question. You know, I've been following it a lot um, in terms of where the morbidity rates are coming from. And it is extremely, um, it is extremely eye-opening that many of the smaller locally run types of facilities had a greater success rate than the larger corporate multi-billion dollar corporations that were running these. And, and I'm going to be brutally blunt here that Courtyard is owned by a huge conglomerate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's clear to me that even some of the reports that were coming from the management of those local establishments and, and the employees, they were begging for help but corporate was not willing to admit at the time that they may have a problem. Uh, that's, that's certainly, certainly what I've been able to learn. Um, and, you know, I do have to say that I haven't been going to the doors of facilities. Um, I, you know, I've been getting my information by telephone or email, but I speak almost every day to the State Department of Public Health and um, I think there, for a long time there was a disconnect between how poorly some facilities were being run and, you know, and the, the level of care that the administration assumed that every operator would adhere to. 
Yeah, I just, you know, that's the dark side of how corporate operates, but I do want to give, um, I do want to give our friends here in Somerville, uh, the Visiting Nurses, uh, Visiting Nurses Association, as you know, um, you know, Linda Cornell, Mike knows Linda Cornell. Um, Linda made the decisions because she could very, very early on to take decisive action. And I, I just, as you know, I stay in touch with Linda. Um, the updated numbers have held steady since early to mid-March. So they have had no deaths within those two facilities directly linked to, to COVID, and they still only have two confirmed cases amongst their staff. So I just wanted to point that out when we're talking about, you know, folks who may have their parents or loved ones in a, a, a senior type facility. Um, we are so fortunate to have the VNA, the, those two VNA facilities, as well as I think mo a lot of the listeners know that the VNA of Eastern Massachusetts has purchased uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor facility up on Highland, um, but because that deal has not been totally consummated at this point, Linda cannot officially or unofficially report those numbers, but she gives me assurance that those numbers are holding steady as well. So I just, for the Somerville-centric um, I, I want to kind of put that out there as the good news part of it. What are you working on, Denise, from the state level in terms of, of how we're going to move forward with our senior care facilities? Well, since I'm not running for re-election, I'm, I'm really focusing my, my efforts in the here and now. Um, but I, I certainly have recommendations, um, which I've, I've been making very freely to Department of Public Health that, that has a, a nursing home group that's monitoring the conditions inside nursing homes. Um, and because I'm not r running for reelection, um, I feel I feel free to be as candid as um, as a legislator can be uh, with, within those discussions, uh, and you know, and I'll be candid with you that I was very disappointed that it took a, an overall death rate of over fifty percent in in the nursing homes before the Baker administration, for instance, required the testing of all staff, which Let's, couldn't be done instantly anyway. You know, that will take time as well. Right. So let's stay with, um, you know, I mean, I don't let anyone off the hook when it comes to my disappointment. So I certainly will have my opportunity. But the governor, let's stay with the governor for a minute. He has formed this reopening advisory board. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the criticisms that he is getting loud and clear is from labor and from workers, is that this seems to be highly, highly corporate centric with CEOs from major industries sitting on that board with the public health folks. Um, so where, where is the disconnect with the governor on this? Why is he not including labor? Uh, I can't speak for the, the governor's decision about how to constitute the advisory board. Um, and, you know, anybody who, who was reading uh, the Herald, for instance, knows that, that there, there are theories about why it was constituted as it was. But as you say, it's um, uh, along many measures, not at all diverse. It's very heavy with CEOs um, of the businesses that have representatives on the group. Several are in tech. You would think, you know, one person from tech, that's fine. But, um, you know, and, and as, as, um, as Representative Connolly mentioned, he, you know, he signed on to a letter that Rep Gouveia and I put together asking the governor to open the reopening advisory board to, to more sectors and more points of view. Um, from what I understand from, from Steve Tolman of AFL-CIO, the, 
the board has met with some representatives from organized labor, but I still think that there are a lot of missing components um, in the advisory board. Let's jump over to Rep Conley for one second. Sure. Mike, if we can stay on the reopening advisory board because I'm getting a lot of um, dissatisfied customers, so to speak. A lot of folks I know in labor, a lot of folks I know in the um, non-union labor workforce are highly, highly uh, suspect of what's going to come out of this advisory board. They're sensing that what is good for corporate America going forward and the recommendations that will be made may not be in the best interest of the smaller business and the labors. You, you want to talk about that for one second? Absolutely. Thanks, Joe. And, and thank you, Rep Provo, for your leadership on this, along with Rep Gavea. You know, this board has 17 members. So when myself and others criticized Governor Baker, he said, well, you know, we can't have everybody on the board. Okay, fine. We can't have everyone on the board, but we have 17 members, not a single representative of nurses, no representative of teachers, no representative of organized labor, or of any of these frontline workers that are we are now calling heroes, people who are often risking their lives uh, for minimum wage pay. And just to take one quick step back, you know, let's put this in context here. Of course, we're all working hard, we're all doing the best we can, but in the grand scheme of things, what we are witnessing is a slow motion tragedy. And we shouldn't just take it for granted that innocent people have to die. The fact is that the leadership, both in you know the federal level, in the White House, and I would say to a real extent um, with Governor Baker, they've done a poor job of managing this so far. And so you know to now turn to the business community and say, we're going to put you in charge of figuring out the reopening, I'm very concerned. Final thing I'll add. Um, we've seen the number of new confirmed cases go up for the past three days. And so, like everybody else, I would love for us to be able to get back to normal. I'm hoping for the day when we can safely reopen. But when the cases have gone up for three days in a row, that's the wrong direction. So what it doesn't, I would like So it doesn't seem like it's safe right now. I mean, I mean, it, they... it really doesn't. And, and frankly, just this talk of reopening, this sort of premature talk of reopening, I'm afraid it sends the message to people that, you know, it's time to just sort of put the social distancing aside. What I would like to see is consistent, you know, 15 days or so of declining case numbers, along with uh, universally available testing and you know, PPE available to all who need it. At that point, you know, then I think the conversation should begin. Right, right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw one thing over, uh, one thing in that I wanna throw it back to State Rep Provo to talk a little bit about the brutal state budget that's gonna be coming up, which is gonna affect the municipalities anyway. You know, in, my, uh, in the, the business of the Somerville Media Center, we have been trying to figure out what that looks like going forward. What does our business model look like going forward? How are we going to re-engage with the public? And this morning, I got the outline from the staff at the media center. And alone, just alone, the steps that we would have to take in order to try to open it first to the staff only, mm -hmm. to try to put the protocols in place for the staff. It is a 50 touch point plan on how we would have to figure that out. If the media center moves to appointment only, thereby controlling the number of people that come into our facility, it jumps to 250 touch points. From that point, if we operate in the new normal sometime later this year, that jumps exponentially to 500 different uh, protocols that we would have to be aware of to safely re-engage with the public in our facility. So for people to think that any municipality or state is going to be able to come out with a rock solid plan by May 18th, that is not realistic. So I want to jump back to the state budget for a minute with state rep.
Provo. State budget, I know the pressure that everyone's under, but I use the word brutal. I think it's going to be brutal. Well, yes, the the second um, the second plague that we're dealing with here is an economic one um, on the verge of turning into a fiscal one. Uh, the the numbers came out this week for, for state revenue for Massachusetts compared with last year. We're down $2.3 billion from this point last year. And of course, our fiscal year, fiscal year 2020 extends until the 30th of June. So we have, you know, plenty of opportunity for greater losses. Uh, last week, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston economists came out with projections for shortfalls, which I'm going to read to you because I hate doing numbers by memory. Um, so for, for this fiscal year, fiscal year 2020. Which, for those who don't follow along with calendar year budgets versus fiscal year, the fiscal year ends on? On June 30th, and then July 1st starts the new fiscal year, which is why yesterday the House met for the first time ever in a virtual formal session in order to authorize the issuance of bonds to raise, you know, money short term uh, in order to keep the Commonwealth operating until revenues start to come in, presumably mid-July. So um, as of April 29th, the Federal Reserve was saying in this fiscal year, 3.8 billion to 4.5 billion shortfall. And we've already made up 2.3 billion of that. For the next fiscal year, the one that starts July 1st, 3.4 billion to 7.2 billion. And, and those are estimates, you know, it could. Um, so clearly, Denise, state and municipal folks who put these budgets together are gonna have to brace themselves. Yes, and, and I've heard of some municipalities that, that are already laying off staff or anticipating laying off staff, including in the schools, which is very sad after all the effort that we made last year toward a bill With to... the education reform. Exactly, yeah. uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and you know the because unlike the federal government the state can't go into into a deficit um really the place to look for additional funds is the federal government right which right. Did, did put some local government funds into the cares act but in order to qualify for them you had to be a city with a population of over a million or a county government. And neither of these really fit with Massachusetts, although Plymouth County did apply and get $90 million under the CARES Act. And Governor Baker has asked the county to turn that money over to the state toward its um, additional COVID costs, and it doesn't want to. Boy, that sounds like a show all on its own. Denise, yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut over to Mike for a minute, Please. and Mike, um, you know, Rep. Provo has made uh, she's made reference to the fact that she has found a new liberation uh, since she is not running for re-election. But you yourself have never been shy in criticizing Governor Baker in um, some of the things that we're facing. So why don't you take it away in terms of um, how you think Governor Baker is doing? What is going to come out of this? Um, uh, kind of, what do I want to call this? Um, the re reopening advisory board for corporate America. Let, let me rename that. 
And then okay. you, you do want to talk about the decarceration efforts that are underway for the congregate housing within our jails and our prisons. So take it away, Mike. Sure. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, you know, and I think we're in a time of crisis and clearly, you know, I believe people want to see uh, their elected officials working together. So it certainly doesn't bring me any joy um, or satisfaction to offer a critique of the governor. Uh, and to be fair, you know, I think our governor is working really hard and people, you know, him and his staff um, have taken numerous steps that we can see are, are paying off in a good way. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think as legislators, you know, we do have uh, an oversight role and, you know, government was set up with checks and balances. And I think it is really important for those of us as legislators, we're the ones who probably have the most information coming to us. We have probably the best access um, to pick up the phone and talk to a, a secretary of a department and get answers or ask questions. We're in a great position to uh, offer critique and criticism. And in this situation, you know, it's hard to be silent. You know, I think back to uh, the middle of March, we had about 200 cases confirmed in Massachusetts and Washington State was around on the order of about 800 cases confirmed. You fast forward about two weeks, and that was when we started sounding the alarm, and, and Ben Ewan and Campen um, started a big petition online to shut down Massachusetts. It got close to like 50,000 signatures, I think. Um, we really had to make a lot of noise just to ask the governor to do things that other states were already starting to do. We were slow. You remember the governor was on vacation when this all started. Um, he had to cancel his vacation and come back. Other states had already sort of been ahead of us. Anyways, Washington state is at around 800 cases. We're at around 200 cases. Two weeks later, we've exceeded 10,000 cases and Washington state is around 7,000 cases approximately. And I think, you know, the reason why, you know, Councilor Camp Ben and Campen started that petition and the reason why Rep Provo and the Somerville delegation immediately started calling on the governor to shut things down is the logic of this terrible, terrible virus. It spreads exponentially. And so that means that every time one individual gets infected, that means multiple other people could be infected. And so well, of course, you know, I think there's a lot of progress we can talk about, and we certainly want to accentuate the positive as best we can. I really don't want us to lose sight of the fact that what we're talking about here are human lives, and we're talking about our constituents and their family members who are losing loved ones as a result of this disease. And we don't want to, you know, um, play around, you know, fast and loose with the recommendations here. One example. You know, the governor. Opened. Mike, let me, let me ask you oh, yeah. one question then. <laughs> the Once you get me going, Joe. I'm I know, Mike, going. I so know. Thanks for and, jumping in. And I'm glad this is virtual so that I don't have to like look up to the ceiling to get your attention here. So right. that lead, that's a good segue, though, into, you know, the reopening advisory board. I mean, how are they going to balance this thing and say, OK, um, we need to get corporate America working again. And what's the trade off against a resurgence of the pandemic, an increase in numbers, an increase in number of deaths. Where are they going to divide that and where are they going to draw that line? I'm very worried about, you know, the logic that they will apply. You know, I mean, we've, you know, we live in a system of, um, you know, the way capitalism works in our country. All too often, you know, human lives are sacrificed for someone else's short term profit. And I think a key point that we have to remember, you know, as we think about, you know, and certainly I'm very concerned about Somerville Media Center and, and all the different struggles, our local businesses, and nonprofits, what everyone's going through. One point we can't lose sight of, the best thing for the economy, the best thing for the reopening is to get the public health situation under control as completely and as thoroughly as we can. The worst possible outcome 
would be is if we all went through this difficult time and if we had all this economic hardship and we started to bring the numbers down and then all of a sudden we were, you know, a little too, um, you know, uh, permissive about how we open things up. And then the next thing you know, we're right back with a raging epidemic. Right. And we've gone through all the resources uh, along the way. But so, it, Mike, you know, it is, it comes down to the way corporate America thinks. What's the cost benefit analysis? The cost exactly. may be more lives. The benefit may be more people go back to work. I, I, I want to try to move you along a little bit, Mike, on the, um, yeah, while, we're, while we're going okay. after some certain elected officials, uh, Speaker DeLeo kind of had trouble with um, some transparency issues. And you folks seem to have taken care of that where he wanted to increase the number for the roll call. Correct. Uh, so, you know, we uh, have been calling for a while now, the Progressive Caucus, that we want to do remote legislating. You know, the city of Somerville was able to roll it out very quickly. Um, us at the state level, there had to be some legal analysis to know if this was even permissible. It was determined that, you know, under the Constitution, the House of Representatives sets its own rules. And so that empowered us to come up with rules for remote legislating. Uh, last Monday evening, the uh, draft rules came out and there was one item in there that caused a great deal of concern for myself and a lot of folks, uh, progressives on the left and ironically, conservatives on the right. Um, together, many people were concerned that the threshold to ask for a recorded roll call vote um, was proposed to go up from 10% of the body, which would be 16 members, to 25% of the body, which would be 40 members in this remote environment. 40 and members out of how, how many reps in the House? 160. 160, right. Um, and so I uh, very quickly you know, started working with colleagues and, and advocates and was able to um, really communicate, I think, to House leadership that you know, this was the exact wrong thing to do. It would send the wrong message. Unfortunately, uh, within, you know, 24 hours, they agreed with us and they removed that provision from the rules. Um, there was still an effort over a few days to hammer out the details. The good news, as you heard, yesterday we held our first formal remote session and I'm certainly hopeful uh, that'll allow us to do more work in the Very weeks good. to come. Very good. One small victory, Mike. And we're going to have to have you back because I got about 30 seconds left. But you do, you are concentrating on the decarceration efforts. Um, I've been following it. Uh, Rep, Rep Conley has a terrific newsletter that encapsulates a lot of stuff that has been going on. We're going to follow that, Mike. I promise you, if you want to come back. Absolutely. Happy. Um, and then today, the governor was announcing the contact tracing efforts that will begin. I think probably next week, uh, whoever comes on from the state delegation, I'm going to make that one of the top priorities that, that we can talk about that. So okay. I'm, I'm sorry we're out of time. We originally all agreed that this was going to be a 28-minute program, but I have a feeling that we're in need of a new town hall at one hour. So I'm going to put that out for the entire delegation, Rep. Provo, yourself, Senator Jalen, and Rep. Barber. For the Somerville Media Center, I want to thank Rep. Provo, Rep. Conley. See you next time.